Hey everyone, it's Ben from board to bits and welcome to part three of our series on creating a character controller in Unity. Now that we have our controller structure planned out, we can start building it step by step. Our process starts with our device tracker, or specifically our keyboard tracker, and the input manager. But in order for these to work efficiently, we need to decide on what input we actually want to track. This is important because a keyboard will generally have like 80 to over 100 keys on it. And we don't, especially in an action-oriented game, you don't want to overwhelm your player with too many decisions. We really want to narrow that decision space down. Compare, you know, that 100 plus keys to a gamepad, which usually will have something closer to 16 or 20 keys on it. In fact, we're going to take this even a step further to kind of understand input architecture and look at a much simpler gamepad, the original Nintendo gamepad. Here we see the gamepad has two buttons on the right. These are your main action buttons. We'll call them buttons one and two. Um, in the middle are these two kind of administrative buttons, the start and select used for things like pausing your gameplay and really managing things inside of menus for the most part. And then on the left we have this directional pad, which could be viewed as these four, four more buttons on the uh, gamepad itself. But really, we should look at it as two axes, this horizontal axis and a vertical axis for controlling, typically controlling movement. And it's important to understand what the difference is between a button and an axis in terms of um, our input and our character controller. So buttons are a binary input. They really have two states, either they're pressed or they're not pressed. In your scripts, you can expand that a little bit more and track things like when the button is pressed or released, if the button's being held down, how long it's being held down for. But these are all things really that your controller script cares more about and not the actual device tracker. For the purposes of that tracker, it's really just a simple bool, true or false, is it being pressed down or not. Axes, on the other hand, are tracking a range, typically between negative one and one, and their default state is at zero. These often use a joystick for a little bit more nuanced tracking between the endpoints. If you push a joystick all the way, it'll hit one or negative one. However, if you just nudge it, you're gonna hit a number somewhere in between those whole numbers. Axes are also often paired up so that you're gonna have a horizontal and a vertical axis, which marries up nicely with the fact that you're often you know, viewing a game on a two-dimensional space like a TV screen or a computer monitor. And because these um, axes are tracking non-whole numbers, between negative one and positive one, we're gonna convert this into a float so that we can track it in our scripts. So fortunately for our keyboards and the NES controller, we don't need a joystick for our axis control. We can get basically the same effect with two buttons, although we're gonna be giving up the nuanced level of control. Basically what we do is this. Take any axis and you're gonna pick two buttons, one to be your positive button and one to be the negative. When the positive button is pressed, the axis is gonna be considered at, to be at one. When the negative button is pressed, the axis is at negative one. If neither button is pressed, or if both are pressed, then it's typically going to be zero. It's worth noting that um, things like your directional pad or your joystick actually are physically designed to prevent opposite buttons on an axis being pressed. But on something like a keyboard, where we have two um, completely separate buttons, they can both be pressed, so it's important to be aware of that and plan for if that should happen. Let's look at what we need in our game. We're going to have a few different control setups that we're building for. We're going to have a walking controller, which is going to have movement in terms of left and right, forward and back, as well as jumping, and also some additional actions like interacting and attacking. Our driving controller is going to have a left and right movement as well through steering, but instead of forward-backward, we're going to have an accelerator and a brake, and then also we want to have an action available to leave the vehicle. Lastly, we're going to have our flight controller, and here we're going to have a few more questions. We're still going to want to move left and right, but we're going to need to decide when we get to this controller, how do we want to handle moving forward and back? Is that still controlled via an axis, or is it automatically controlled? Um, likewise, our altitude moving up and down, is that an axis? Is that a button? Is that automatic? Um, do we still want to have a jump available to us? And we do know that we're going to want an action to be able to exit the flight mode and go back to walking as normal. So if we organize these different controls by their input types, we see that the walk controller needs two axes and three buttons. Our vehicle controller only needs one axis, but still three buttons. And our flight controller still has some questions, but it looks like it's gonna be about two or three axes as well as two or three buttons to control it. We can kind of boil this down right now and look and see, we're gonna want two axes and three buttons, possibly another axis or a couple of buttons for the flight controller. And that really translates pretty naturally to two floats and three bools. 
And all of that looks like it would fit very nicely into a struct. And that's actually what we're going to do. We're going to create a, a struct called input data that is going to be what the uh, device tracker creates with the in appropriate information inside of it and then passes to the input manager for us. To keep our input data flexible, we're instead of specifying a specific number of axes and buttons, we're actually just going to use an array of axes and an array of buttons. This is also going to prevent us from falling into a really kind of common trap, which is we might look and want to say like, oh, this button is the jump button. But the problem that we run into with that is that when we're walking around, yes, our jump button jumps, but then once we get into the vehicle, now suddenly our jump button is responsible for accelerating our vehicle. And that you can certainly have that in your code and say if jump button accelerate, but it's a little bit confusing. And it makes a lot more sense to just use the indexing of the array to say, the button at index zero is our most important, that's our primary button. When we're walking around, that makes us jump. When we're driving around, that makes us accelerate. So let's jump into Unity and start setting up this struct so that it can be passed from our device tracker to our input manager. Okay, so we're here in our input manager script and we're going to add our input data struct to this file. We're gonna add it outside of the input manager class, but we, I wanna keep it kind of with the input manager because they are very closely related. So we're going to say public struct input data. And inside here, we're going to have two public variables, a public array of floats called axes, and a public array of bools called buttons. We're going to create a constructor for this. This is going to be a simple public input data. It's going to take two ints, one called axis count and one called button count. And it's going to set axes equal to a new float array with a length of axis count. And likewise for buttons, a new bool array with button count as its length. Now, we can jump over to our device tracker. And the device tracker really kind of relies on the input manager because a device tracker is passing its information to the input manager, if there isn't an input manager to pass that information to, it really has no purpose. So we're going to actually require component type of input manager. This is going to make sure that whenever we have a device tracker on a game object, there's always an input manager to go with it. And bear in mind, this is on the device tracker class, not the keyboard tracker, but because this inherits from device tracker, it now also requires the input manager. Likewise, we're actually never going to want a device tracker on its own. So we're just gonna make this an abstract class. Abstract class, there we go. So that we, can, we could never actually put this device tracker onto a game object, but we could put the keyboard tracker on it instead. So back over to device tracker, got that added in there. The other thing we can do here is we can create a reference to our input manager now that we know that it's here. So we're going to say protected input manager I am. And the reason we're making it protected is that we don't need everything to be able to access this, but we do want our keyboard tracker to just kind of naturally access it. So I'm gonna say protected input manager I am. And I'm gonna put in an awake function here so that once we start our scene, I am equals get component input manager. So that makes that a lot easier for us to work with. We're also going to put in a couple more protected variables here. One is going to be the input data. We'll just call that data. And the second is a simple bool called new data, which is going to track for us every single frame we're going to check and see, is there new, new input data being put in? If there is, then we can send it to the input manager. If not, 
we don't even have to worry about it. We don't have to continue through the process. So we're going to kind of keep our update process as quick as possible. So that's all we need to do in the device tracker right now. In our input manager, I'm going to create a new function so that it can actually receive the um, input data as the, when the keyboard tracker has it. So we're going to create a public void function called pass input and it's going to receive or it's going to have input data as a parameter so that it can receive that input data take a look at it and then pass it as appropriately to its controller. We're not actually going to do anything with this function right now but we're, we just want to have that there so that our keyboard tracker can send it to the input, input manager. Lastly here We've got our keyboard tracker. Every update function, what we're going to be doing here is we're going to check for inputs. If inputs are detected, we're going to change that new data to true. Set new data to true. So that then we know that we want to send it from our keyboard tracker to the input manager. And so once, once all those inputs are detected, we're going to then say if new data, and you'll see because it's protected, we can access that. If new data, then we're going to do three things. We're going to pass the input data we have to the input manager, which in order to do that, we have to access our data. So we're just going to say I am dot pass input data. Bearing in mind that I am is from our device tracker, is the input manager we got. And likewise, data is the data that we're storing here. We're going to then set new data back to false so that the next frame, when the next frame comes around, we're not thinking there's still new data to be passed. And we're going to say data.reset which is going to reset that um, input data for us as well because again we don't want to have old data in there um, unless there's just it's just saying everything's in its default state which case it can stay as that until it updates. So we do need to create this reset function however it doesn't exist right now. So go back to our input data struct we're going to create a new public function called public void reset and all this is going to do is say for, tab a couple times, get pre-populates your for loop. We're going to say for i equals 0, and if i is less than axes.length, then axes i equals 0f. So we're just going to go through all of our axes and set them to 0. And then similarly, for tab tab, i equals 0, i button dot length buttons i equals false. So we're going to set all of the buttons to false. We are not being pressed at this time. And you can use, um, it's a little odd that we're using i for both of these, but because this loop then closes itself and it's, you know, all set and done, we can restart using i again here because it's no longer being used um, as a variable. So that reset basically takes our input data and if anything's been changed in it, sets it all back to the default values. Hit save there. So now what's happening in our keyboard tracker is we're passing the existing data, whatever it is, whatever that input data is, to the input manager. We are forgetting the fact that there was new data, saying nope, no new data here, and then resetting that data so that there's no new information in the data that might that we don't want to continue from frame to frame. So now at this point, this system works where we can take this input data pass and pass it to the input manager. However, we don't we're not populating it yet. We don't know, you know, what the keyboard tracker what the keyboard tracker really needs to do here in addition to setting new data to true, we need to create and not create our data input data, but we need to populate input data to pass 
to the input manager. But at this point, we don't really know what keys are we looking for. We know, we know we're going to have a certain number of buttons and a certain number of axes to look out for, but we don't know what those are yet. So in our next video, we're going to take um, our input manager, actually set up the number of axes we need and the number of buttons we need, and then our keyboard tracker is going to take that information and say, okay, I need this many key codes to look for, to look for these specific um, types of inputs. So that's what we're going to do in our next video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.